Amen. Well, thank you for being here and thank you for having me. Of course, I want to thank Pastor Anderson for letting me to preach and for, of course, Brother Corbin. And I know it's the one year anniversary, so congratulations to everyone here. And I'm appreciative for all your hospita hospitality and for the great gift that I got. I got this beautiful key <laughs> for the bathroom. <laughs> And uh, I hope I can take it back with me. I don't know if TSA will allow it. I might use it as a weapon in case I need to go to the bathroom, you know. But it was great. So just thank you, everyone. And so we're there in Nehemiah chapter number four. And in Nehemiah four, we see Nehemiah in Jerusalem. And I want you to understand the reason or the purpose that Nehemiah is allowed to go to Jerusalem. Go to Nehemiah two, look at verse number five. The Bible says in Nehemiah two, in verse five, it says, And I said unto the king, If it please the king, and if thy servant have found favor in thy sight, that thou wouldest send me into Judah unto the city of my father's sepulchres. And notice the reason that Nehemiah goes back. He says, notice that I may build it. So here we have Nehemiah wanting to go back to Jerusalem for the purpose of building a city that is broken down, a city that has been desolate, a city that has been in ruin, and he wants to go back to do a great work for God that he may build it. Nehemiah 2, look at verse number 18. Nehemiah 2, 18, it says, Then I told them of the hand of my God, which is good upon me, as also the king's words that he had spoken unto me, and they said, notice, let us rise up and build. So they strengthened their hands, notice, for this good work. See, the purpose for Nehemiah's return to Jerusalem is for a good work. It was to build a city that was broken down, uh, to build a city that is in ruin. And in the same way, you know, this church is here for a good work. It is to build a city that is broken down in sin, to build a city that is lost, to build a city for, for Christ's sake. And go to Nehemiah 4, look at verse 19. And what you have to understand is that the work that you're doing in this church, it's a great work. The work that Nehemiah was doing was a great work for God. Nehemiah 4, look at verse number 19. It says, And I said unto the nobles, in verse 19, and to the rulers, and to the rest of the people, notice, the work is great and large. See, the work that he said he was doing, it was great and large. See, the work that you're doing in Tucson, it's a great work, but it's a large work. It's a big responsibility, and this church is doing a great work for God. And in the same way, you have been called to build something for God, to build this city that is in ruin. And what Nehemiah brought to Jerusalem was two things. Nehemiah brought relief, and he brought revival to a city. Look at, go back to Nehemiah 1, if you would. Nehemiah chapter 1. And in Nehemiah 1, Nehemiah asks about the condition of Jerusalem. He asks about the condition of the people. Nehemiah 1, look at verse number 3. And they said unto me, notice, the remnant. Who is that? That's the people. It says, the remnant that are left of the captivity there, notice, in the province are in great affliction and reproach. See, the people in Jerusalem were in great affliction. They're in great reproach. The people in the city of Tucson, they're in great affliction. They're in great reproach. See, what do they need? They need relief. They need relief from the power of Satan. They need relief from the power of sin. It goes on in verse 3. It says, notice, the wall of Jerusalem also is broken down, and, their ga and the gates thereof are burned with fire. See, the city was dead. And what they needed was not just relief, but they needed revival. And in the same way, the people who are not saved, the people who are bound in sin, they need relief. And the city of Tucson here, it needs revival for the, for the kingdom of God. Amen. And what are you bringing for Tucson, is you're bringing relief and you're bringing revival. Go to, if you, go if you would to, keep your place in Nehemiah, but go to Acts 26. Acts chapter number 26. And the same thing that Nehemiah brought is the same thing that you as a church, what you are bringing, the great work that you're doing in the city is you're bringing relief to people who are hopeless. You're bringing revival to a city that needs the word of God, that needs people to get their lives right, for them to build up a city for the Lord. You're going to Acts 26, if you would Acts 26, and then the same thing that Nehemiah brought is what you're bringing to Tucson. Notice it says, what are you bringing? Acts 26, look at verse number 18. It says, notice, to open their eyes. See, people are blind to the truth. People are lost. They need someone to help them see. It says to open their eyes, notice, and to turn them from darkness to light. See, people are stuck in darkness. They're, start, they're, they're stuck in sin. They're bound in sin, and they need to be turned from darkness to light. Notice, and from the power of Satan unto God. Notice that they may receive forgiveness. What is that? That's relief. That they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. So Nehemiah goes back to Jerusalem to do a great work for God. To do what? To bring relief. To bring revival to a city. In the same way, this church is doing the same thing. It's looking to build people. It's looking to build something great for the kingdom of God. But go back if you go to Nehemiah 4. Nehemiah chapter 4 where we started. And what you have to understand is 
whenever you in life, whenever you as a Christian decide to build something for God, whenever you decide to do anything for God, you must understand that there will be opposition. Nehemiah 4, look at verse number one. It says, but it came to pass that when, notice, Sanballat heard that we built the wall, notice, he was wroth and took great indignation, notice, and mocked the Jews. Here we have the opposition. Here we have the enemy. It goes on in verse two. It says, notice, and he spake before his brethren and the army of Samaria and said, notice, what do these feeble Jews? They begin to mock the work that they're doing. In the same way, like people will mock this church. People will mock at you for going to church three times a week, for reading your Bible, for going so many. They're going to mock at you, but you know what? It's a great work. And you got to expect opposition. Notice it goes on. It says, will they fortify themselves? Will they sacrifice? Will they make an end in a day? You know what they're saying? They're saying it's never going to get done. There's no way you're going to accomplish this great work. Will, will they make an end in a day? And when you look at that map, you know, that's a big map. Right. And you see the, what's been shaded in. There's, a, there's much more to be done. Right. The work is great and the work is large. But the opposition, what they'll do is they'll mock at you and they'll make you doubt, you know, is it ever going to get done? But you know, it can get done. Yeah. This church yeah. can do it. Right. The work is great, but it can be done. Notice, it, they keep mocking. It says, will they revive the stones out of the heaps of the rubbish which are burned? Look, they want you to doubt the great work that you're doing. They want to cause doubt that this is a great work. That this is a great work for God. And look at verse number three. It says, now Tobiah the Ammonite was by him. And he said, even that which they build, if a fox go up, he shall even be broke. He shall even break down their stone wall. And so in life, when you decide to build your life for God, whenever you decide to go to church and build something great for God, understand that there will be opposition. There will be people who want to mock at you, who want to make you quit, who want to make you doubt the great work that you're doing. And so don't be surprised when the world comes against you, when Satan comes against you, because why? Because whenever you do anything for God, there will be opposition. If you want to clean up your life, people will go against you. People will go against you because you want to get your life right. When you decide, hey, I'm going to quit drinking alcohol, I'm going to quit doing drugs, people will actually go against you for doing those things, for trying to get right with God. Right. It's, it's foolishness, but you know what? This is what, the, this is what the world will do. They will oppose you for doing a great work. But I want you to notice what these enemies of God do in verse number 8. Notice Nehemiah 4, 8. Notice what it says, and notice, and notice this word, conspired all of them together to come and to fight against Jerusalem and to hinder it. These people, these enemies of God, what do they do? Notice they conspired. They cause a conspiracy to fight against the work of God. And this morning I'm preaching about the conspiracy to stop the word of God. You see, I believe, and according to the Bible, there is a conspiracy to stop the great work that's being done in this church. There is a conspiracy to stop the work of God. And what the enemies will do is that they will conspire. They will conspire to stop, to fight against the work of God. And this morning I'm telling you that there is a conspiracy. There is a conspiracy to stop the great work that's been done. You see, it's only been a year. The wall has barely began to be built. But you know what? Even now, the opposition is there. Even now, there is a conspiracy to make you stop this great work that's being done. And in any conspiracy, I have three points this morning. In any conspiracy, there is a mastermind. The, the, who is the mastermind to this conspiracy? We'll look at verse number seven. It says in Nehemiah 4, 7, But it came to pass that when Sanballat and Tobiah and the Arabians and the Ammonites and the Ashdodites heard that the walls of Jerusalem were made up and that the breaches began to be stopped. Then they were very wroth, notice, and conspired all of them to come together. And so here we see who? We see the masterminds. Who are the masterminds against Nehemiah? Well, we have Sanballat. We have Tobiah. We have the Arabians, the Ammonites, the Ashdodites. See, behind any conspiracy, there's a mastermind. There's somebody behind the conspiracy wanting to take charge to stop this great work. And here we see the masterminds behind the conspiracy. But you know, there is a mastermind this morning to stop the great work that's being done in this church. Can you place it in Nehemiah 4? But go to 1 Peter chapter number 5. 1 Peter 5. You see, there is a mastermind. Behind any conspiracy, there's a mastermind. And this morning, there is a mastermind to the conspiracy of stopping the great work that's being done here. First Peter 5, look at verse number 8. First Peter 5, 8, the Bible says, notice, be sober. What does that mean? Yes, it means be sober. Hey, don't be a drunk. But you know what it means? It means be serious. Right. And you got to take your Christian life serious. Right. It says be sober. Notice, be vigilant. Vigilant means you're being watchful. You're not sleeping. You're watching. Notice, because notice, your adversary. Who is this adversary? It says, notice, your adversary, the devil as a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Right. See, who is the mastermind behind the conspiracy to stop Faithful War Tucson? It is the devil. Yeah. It's your adversary, the devil. And you know, we keep hearing that, yeah, the devil's your enemy, but the Bible says you better be sober. Take it serious. 
because there is a devil. He does want to stop this great work and you ought to be vigilant, be watchful. Don't be sleeping and think, oh, it's just another sermon. The devil's behind it. But you know what? The devil is attacking. Amen. The devil has a conspiracy to stop this church. Notice what it says in verse nine. It says, whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that what? Knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. It says, it says the same afflictions, the same battles, the same fights are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. See, at my church, at Verity Baptist Church, there is a conspiracy to stop our church. Right. You say, who's the mastermind? It's the devil. Oh. Faithful word in Tempe. There is a conspiracy to stop that great work. Who is the mastermind? It is the devil. Right. See, the same afflictions are accomplished in your, in your brethren that are in the world. You're not the only one, but there is a mastermind and the devil is working at fighting, at stopping, at hindering the great work that's being done. In this church, go to Ephesians chapter number six, if you would. Ephesians six. So who is the mastermind? It's the devil. And the Bible says, be sober, be vigilant. Ephesians six, look at verse number 11. It says, notice, Ephesians six eleven. put on the whole armor of God. Notice that you may, that you may be able to stand against, notice this word, against the wiles of the devil. The word wiles means plots or schemes. See, the devil has conspiracies. The devil has plots and ideas and plans to stop this great work. Notice verse 12, it says, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood. You see, the battle in the Christian life is not a physical battle. And oftentimes as Christians, we get distracted by, by flesh and blood. You know, we think, well, I better get into politics to fight the enemy. But you know what? Donald Trump is not the mastermind. Right. You know, we should preach against, you know, Donald Trump. We should preach against the wicked politicians. But you know, he's not the mastermind. You know, the sodomites, we ought to preach against them. You know, obviously they're a battle we have to fight, but they are not the mastermind. Right. So don't get distracted by flesh and blood thinking that this is the enemy. You know, the enemy is the devil. Why? Because we wrestle not against flesh and blood. It goes on, but it says, but against principalities, against powers. Notice, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against what? Against spiritual wickedness in high places. You see, it is a spiritual battle. There is a spiritual battle going on and the devil would love nothing more than to stop this great work. And so don't think it's a fleshly battle. No, it's a spiritual battle. And who is the mastermind? The mastermind is the devil. Go back to Nehemiah 4 if you would. So there is a conspiracy to stop this church. There is a conspiracy to stop the great work that has been done and the great work that will continue to be done. Who's the mastermind? The mastermind is the devil. But I want you to notice the motive of the conspiracy. What is the motive? What is the goal, the end game of the conspiracy? Nehemiah 4, look at verse number seven again. It says, but it came to pass that when Sanballat and Tobiah and the Arabians and the Ammonites and the Assadites heard that the walls of Jerusalem were made up and that the breaches began to be stopped, then they were very wroth and conspired all of them together and notice, and to fight against Jerusalem, notice, and to hinder it. See, the ultimate motive, the ultimate goal is to stop the work of God, right. is to stop souls getting saved. It's to stop this great work that's being done. Go to verse number 11. It says, and our advers adversary said, they shall not know, neither see till we come in the midst among them, notice, and slay them. And notice, and what's the goal? And cause the work to cease. You see, this morning we heard that people have been getting saved, you know, since the church started. God, the devil wants that to cease. You know, in this church, maybe you've gotten your life right. Maybe you've gotten victory over some sin. The devil wants that work to cease. See, the, the motive, the goal is to stop, to hinder the work of God. Go to, go if you would, to John chapter number 10. John chapter number 10. You say, what's the motive? It's the motive is to stop the work of God to cease. John 10. <clears throat> John 10, verse number 10. John 10, 10. In John 10, 10, notice it says about the devil about the mastermind, about the enemy. It says, notice, the thief, who is the thief? It's the devil. The thief cometh not, but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. The Bible says that the devil has one purpose. It's to, it's to steal. It's to kill. It's to destroy people's lives. The devil wants to destroy your life. He wants to send people to help. He doesn't want people to get right with God. He doesn't want people to get saved. No, he came for one purpose. It's to stop. It's to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And notice what he says. Jesus said, I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. See, the opposite of the devil, here we have Jesus Christ. The devil wants to destroy. Jesus said, no, I'm coming to bring life. The devil wants to destroy too, so this church has come to bring life. 
What is, what, is, what is the motive? Is the motive is to make it stop. Go to, go to 2 Thessalonians, if you would. 2 Thessalonians, chapter number 2. 2 Thessalonians 2. You see, what's the motive? What's the end game? It's for the work of God to cease. 2 Thessalonians 2, look at verse number 9. It says, notice, even him, here we have a passage about the Antichrist. Notice, 2 Thessalonians 2, 9 says, even him who's coming, notice, is after what? After the working of Satan. What is the working of Satan? Notice, with all power and signs and lying wonders, with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth. Notice that they might be saved. See, the working of Satan is to keep people blinded that they might be saved. The devil would love nothing more than to stop a soul winning church. And look, I don't know about you, but when I go soul winning in Sacramento, I don't see any other Baptist church knocking doors preaching the gospel. Right. You know what? That's the working of Satan. Satan wants more churches. Satan wants more Christians to get out there and knock doors. And so you got to realize that the work is to stop this church from getting people saved. It says the working of Satan notice that they might be saved. See, God wants people saved, but the devil is consistently fighting this church to stop people from getting saved. See, what are you bringing? You're bringing relief. You're bringing revival. People are lost and dying and going to hell. But you know what? That's the work of Satan. But you, you have come. This church is here to bring life, to bring life to a dead city, to bring revival, to bring relief. And the motive, the end game for the mastermind, the devil, is to stop the great work that has been done. Go back, if you go to Nehemiah 6. So number one this morning, I said, who's the mastermind? The mastermind behind this great conspiracy is the devil. What's the motive? The motive is to stop the work of God. And thirdly, and we're going to spend most of the time here, I want you to notice the methods of the conspiracy. What are the methods of the conspiracy? Because as we fight this, this spiritual battle, there are plots, there are wiles, there are schemes, there are plans, there are methods that the devil is planting to stop the great work that's being done. Go to Nehemiah chapter number six, if you would, Nehemiah six, and look at verse number one. So what are the methods of the conspiracy? How is the devil going to stop the great work that's being done? Nehemiah six, and look at verse number one. It says, now it came to pass when Sanballat and Tobiah, who are these people? These are the, these are the enemies, the adversaries, and Gishan the Arabian. And notice, and the rest of our enemies heard that I had built the wall and that there was no breach left therein, Though at the time I had not set up the doors upon the gates, notice that Sanballat and Geshem, here we have the enemies, sent unto me, saying, notice, notice what they say to Nehemiah, it says, come, let us meet together in some one of the villages in the plain of, the, of Ono. Notice what the enemy comes and does to Nehemiah. He says, hey, come and let's meet together. Let's just meet together in some of the villages in the plain of Ono. It, this doesn't sound bad. It's just saying, you know, come on down, let's, let's go have lunch. Come on down, let's go have a cup of coffee. Come on down, let's just go meet together. Notice, but it says, but they thought to do me mischief. Verse three, and I sent messengers unto them saying, I am doing a great work so that I cannot come down. Why should the work cease whilst I leave it and come down to you? See, what is one of the methods that Satan will do to stop this great works? Satan will wants to distract you. If you notice these people, they don't come bringing anything sinful. All they said is, hey, come on down. Let's just meet together. Let's just go have a cup of coffee together. Let's just go have some lunch together. But what are they doing? They just want to distract you. Whatever they can do to get you from building that wall, they want you to come down and get away. And look, distractions are not necessarily sinful. But in this world, there are many distractions that the devil provides to keep you from the purpose of building that wall, of building that city. The whole point is to bring you down, right. to distract you from the work that's being done. Go if you went to Hebrews chapter number 12. So the first method we see is that the devil, he wants to distract you from the purpose, distract you from the great work that's being done. You're going to Hebrews 12. And look, dis distractions in life, realize that they're not necessarily sinful. They're not necessarily sin. They're just distractions. And the whole point of a distraction is to keep, to take your mind off of the purpose, to take your mind off of what you should be doing as a Christian, Hebrews 12, look at verse number one. It says, notice, wherefore, seeing we also are, com are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Notice what it says. It says, let us lay aside, notice, every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us. The Bible says we ought to lay, lay aside not just the sin. Obviously, the sin is wicked in itself, and we should lay aside the sin. But it says, lay us, let us lay aside every weight 
And the sin, notice, which doth so easily be set us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. The Bible says that there are weights, that there are things in your life that are doing what? They're just holding you down. And imagine you're running in a race and you're carrying these weights. All they're going to do is they're going to slow you down from the work. You're not going to finish the race. But here's the thing. Weights, distractions, they're not necessarily sinful. You know, growing up, I was big into soccer. If there was a game going on, hey, I was watching soccer. But you know what? And there's not, it's not necessarily sinful to watch a soccer game. But you know what? It can be a distraction. If it keeps you from going to church, it, if it keeps you from soul winning, if it keeps you from reading your Bible, from praying, it is a distraction that will cause the work of God to cease in your life. Look, hiking, camping, all these things are not sinful, but you know what? They're distractions that can keep you from your purpose of doing the work of God. And so be careful about the weights in your life, about the distractions. You know, this world is full of distractions. This world is full of just entertainment of amusement, of sports. You know, everyone just, they, they sit down on Sunday morning and it, it's no coincidence why the devil has all the sports game going on on Sundays right. and on Saturdays with college football. It's to distract you from the work that needs to be done. See, the weights, they're not sinful, but they can distract you from the work of God. And look, there are things that are proper and, and right in, in its proper place, but don't allow things that are not necessarily sinful to keep you from doing the great work that God has called you to do. See, Nehemiah said, you know what? I cannot come down to get that cup of coffee. Why? Because there's a work to be done. And you, in this church, realize there's a great work being done. And don't let Satan to, to do it, to distract you, to keep you from doing that work. Go to Mark chapter number four, if you would. Mark four. Mark chapter number four. See, what is one of the methods? One of the methods, methods is to distract you, to get your mind off of the purpose of building what you're building and to get it on something else. And it's not sinful. Mark 4, look at verse number 18. Mark 4, 18. And notice what it says. It says, And these are they, notice, which are sown among thorns. See, some people live their lives among thorns. Notice, such as hear the word, verse 19. But notice, and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches. Notice, and the lust of other things entering in choke the word and it becometh unfruitful. See, there are cares of this world. There are just the lust of other things. And look, these things are not sinful. These things, but you know what these things can do? They can choke the word. They can choke the work, the word of God that is, that is working in you, that is building a great thing in your life. It can choke the word. So think about your life. Are there any weights? Are there any distractions? Are there maybe hobbies? You look, hobbies are good. It's good to have hobbies. It's good to do things, but don't allow those distractions from taking you down from that wall. Because the whole purpose of a distraction is to take you off the purpose. And realize that Satan wants to distract you from doing a great work. So when it comes time to church, go to church. Right. When it's time for soul winning, hey, go soul winning. When it's time to read your Bible and pray, do those things and don't allow a simple distraction from taking you down from the great work that's being done in this church. Go back to Nehemiah 6 if you would. So number one, what's the method? Number one, it's to distract you. What's another method? Go back to Nehemiah 6 if you would. Nehemiah 6. <clears throat> Number two, not only does the devil want to distract you, but he, the devil wants to wear you out. The devil wants to wear you out. In Nehemiah 6, and look at verse number four, it says, yet they sent unto me, notice, four times after this fort. So again, they, they say, hey, come down. Nehemiah says, no. They come the second time. Nehemiah says, no. They come the third time. The, Nehemiah says, no. Notice, they sent unto me four times after the sort. Notice, and I answered them after the same manner. Verse five, then sent Sanballat, his servant, unto me, notice, in like manner the fifth time. These people are relentless. They're not stopping. They keep coming and coming. Verse 6, notice, notice. Wherein was written, it is reported among the heathen, and Gashmu saith, it, that thou and the Jews think to rebel, for which cause thou buildest the wall, that thou mayest be their king, according to these words. Notice, notice the relentless of the lies, just lying and lying and lying. Verse 7, and thou hast also appointed prophets to preach of thee at Jerusalem, saying, there is a king in Judah, and now it shall be reported to the king according to these words. Again, just lie after lie after lie. Trying to get Nehemiah in trouble with the king. Notice, it says, according to these words, come now therefore, verse 7, and let us take counsel together. Notice, these people just keep coming. They're not going to stop. What are they trying to do? They're trying to wear Nehemiah out. Again with the lies. It doesn't stop. It just keeps coming and keep coming. Notice, verse 8, then I said unto him, saying, there are no such things done as thou sayest, but thou feignest them out of thine own heart. Notice verse 9. 
for they all made us afraid, saying, and realize what the enemy is saying. Notice, their hands shall be weakened from the work. You say, what's the method of stopping this great work? The devil wants to weaken your hands. He wants to cause you to faint. He wants you to go weary. He wants you to be weak in the work that's being done. Notice, that it be not done. Now, therefore, O God, notice, strengthen my hands. You see, what's another tactic, another method of the devil? He wants to wear you out. And in the Christian life, people come and go, not because of necessarily sin, but sometimes they come and go because they just get worn out. They get worn out of the Christian life and they get off the wall. They stop building because they got tired, because they got weakened, because they fainted. Go for it to 2 Corinthians chapter number 4. Can you replace her again? But go to 2 Corinthians. See, the devil wants you to faint. The enemy was saying, hey, that their hands may be weakened. You're going to 2 Corinthians 4. You see, what is the devil? What's the method for the attack? The method is that he wants to wear you out. And look, people will quit church because they get wore out. Because it becomes too much. Because three times a week, soul winning every week, reading my Bible and prayer, you get wore out, you get weak, and then you get off the wall and you quit the Christian life. 2 Corinthians 4, look at verse number 8. Notice what Paul says. He said, notice, we are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. You see, what's the Christian life sometimes? Sometimes you feel like you're troubled on every single side. But notice what Paul says, yet not distressed. He says, we are perplexed, but not in despair. Verse 9, persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Here we have Paul saying, yes, I'm troubled. Yes, I'm perplexed. Yes, I'm persecuted. But notice what he's not saying. He's not saying, hey, I'm, in, I'm distressed. He's not saying, hey, I'm in despair. He's not saying, hey, I'm forsaken. He said, you know what? I'm not in distress. He said, I'm not in despair. I'm not forsaken. I'm not destroyed. How is that done, Paul? How is it that a man like Paul can go through what he did in his life and not grow weary, not grow faint? Look at verse number 16. It says, notice, for which cause we faint not. But though our outward man perish, notice, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. See, the outward man will perish in the Christian life. But Paul did not quit. Why? Because the inward man, the spiritual man, the new man was renewed when? Day by day. If you do not read your Bible every day, you will faint in the Christian life. If you every day don't read the Word of God, renew the inward man every day, you will quit. Some people are already on their way out, not because of sin, not because of anything wrong, because they're living the Christian life in the flesh. And the Christian life will be lost if you live it in the flesh. What should you do? Every day you need to renew the inward man. And some people are already on their way out because they don't read the Word of God every single day. You see, what should you do to stay in the fight? You need to renew the inward man every single day. The Word of God is considered food. The Bible says that man does not live by bread only, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Job said, Job said, I have esteemed thy words more than my necessary food. You ought to take your Bible reading more serious than your physical food. As a Christian, you will not survive if you don't read the Word of God every day. I'm not saying you need to read it an hour or two hours. I'm just saying, hey, every day, spend 15 minutes at least reading the Word of God. How are you going to make it? You're not going to make it if you're not reading the spiritual food. Why? Because the Christian life will wear you out physically. But what keeps you going is reading the Word of God. And what you'll notice in church, what I've noticed is that people come and people go, not because they're bad people, because they don't read the Word of God, because they're not renewing the inward man. So don't think, look, there hath no temptation taking you, but such is common man. Don't think that you're the exception to the rule. You will not make it if you don't go home every day and read the Word of God. See, what does Satan want you to do? He wants to distract you from reading the Bible every day. So before you turn on YouTube, before you turn on Facebook, before you turn on TV, Read the Word of God. Read. Fill up the inward man. Why? Because you will die as a Christian without the Word of God because it's more important than your necessary food. See, some of you, you need to go home and just decide every day I'm going to read the Word of God for the sake of not quitting on God. Why? Because Satan, he's going to keep coming. He wants you to get distressed. He wants you to feel forsaken. He wants you to feel cast down. It's going to keep coming. It's not going to stop. The fight doesn't keep stopping. You need to read the God every single day. And don't be the Christian who thinks I can make it in the flesh because you're not going to make it in the flesh. Right. Better men than you, better men than me have quit the Christian life because they quit reading the Bible. And look, before people leave this church, better believe that their Bible reading left a long time ago. 
So don't be the, don't be the casualty. Every day, renew the inward man. You're not going to make it. The outward man will perish, but you know what? The inward man needs to be re renewed when? Every single day. Go back to, to Nehemiah 6, if you would. So what's the method of the conspiracy? The method is to distract you, to take you off that wall. The method is to cause you to faint, to cause you to grow weary. What's another method? We see that the devil, the mastermind, he will send infiltrators. The devil will send infiltrators into the work of God. Nehemiah 6, look at verse number 10. Nehemiah 6, 10, it says, Afterward, I came into the house of Shemaiah, the son of De Deliah, the son of Me Mehetabil. Here we have someone who is a supposed friend of Nehemiah. Someone who claims to be a friend. Notice, who was shut up and he said, notice, let us meet together, notice, in the house of God. Here we have not only a supposed friend, but, a friend, but notice, he's super spiritual. He said, hey, let's meet in the house of God. Because it goes on, it says, within the temple. And let us shut the doors of the temple, notice, for they will come to slay thee. Yea, in the night they will come to slay thee. Here we have someone who is Shemaiah, a supposed friend. Notice, and he's ultra spiritual. He, say, he says, hey, let's meet in the house of God. Let's meet within the temple. And notice, he comes as a protector. He says, notice, for they will come to slay thee. He comes as someone who poses to protect Nehemiah, someone who pretends he's there for his interest. Notice in verse 11, and I said, said such a man as I flee, and who is there that being as I am would go into the temple to save his life? Notice, I will not go. Notice verse 12, and lo, I perceive that God had not sent him, but that he pronounced this prophecy against me. Notice, for Tobiah and Sanballat had hired him. Here we have somebody who claimed to be a friend, claimed to be ultra spiritual, claimed to be a protector of Nehemiah, but all the while he was working for the enemy. All the while he was working for the devil. And here's the thing, this is what Satan will do. You see, what's one of the methods of the conspirator? He will send infiltrators to stop the great work that's being done. Verse 13, therefore, notice, was he hired? Was he working for God or was he working for the enemy? He was working for the enemy. Therefore was he hired that I should be afraid and do so in sin, that they might have matter for an evil report, that they might reproach me. Notice, my God, think thou upon Tobias and Sembalat, according to these their works, and on the prophetess Noadiah and the rest of the prophets that would have put me in fear. See, there's infiltrators all around. Trying to do what? Trying to put Nehemiah in fear. Trying to stop the great work that ne Nehemiah is being done. You say, what's another method? Another method is that the devil will send infiltrators. Right. Go back to 2 Corinthians chapter number 11. 2 Corinthians 11. Here we have somebody who came as a friend. Who came, and notice he was ultra spiritual. Hey, let's meet in the house of God within the temple. I'm here to protect you. I'm here to help you. All the while, this man was working for the enemy, but this is what the devil will do. This devil will send infiltrators to destroy a church. 2 Corinthians 11, look at verse number 12. It says, But what I do, that I will do, that I may cut off occasion from them which desire occasion, that wherein they glory, they may be found even as we. Notice, for such are what? Are false apostles. See, these people claim to be apostles. Notice, deceitful workers. These people are liars. They're deceivers transforming themselves into the apostle of Christ. Verse 14, and no marvel. Notice, for Satan, the mastermind, the conspirator, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. See, Satan doesn't come at you with a hook and horns. He comes at, at you as an angel of light, as a messenger. Hey, I'm your friend. Hey, I'm ultra spiritual. I'm here for your protection. This is how the devil comes. He will come in a suit, with a Bible in hand, looking like you, pretending to be your friend, pretending to help you, all the while trying to destroy the great work of God. Verse 15, therefore notice, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. Look at verse 26, 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 11, 26. In journeys often, in perils of water, in perils of robbers, in perils by mine own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, notice, in perils among false brethren. You, you ever wonder why it's any, is it any coincidence why we, every week or every month we hear, hey, somebody got thrown out of a church for being an infiltrator. And it, why? Because we're doing a great work. Every, and it's not going to stop. And you wonder, when are these people going to stop? These infiltrators, these reprobates, these false prophets trying to hurt the church. And, and what do they want to bring? They want to bring in division and false doctrine. 
They want to divide the church and they want to bring in false doctrine. Look, and it's not going to stop. Why? Because our churches are doing a great work. And look, people in, in a church like yours or people in a church like ours are even here. Look, it's not going to stop. Bad people will creep in. And don't be surprised when it happens. You got to be just, don't be a casualty and go with someone because you thought they were a good person. Look, if they were an infiltrator, if they've been marked, realize, hey, this is the working of Satan. And this is, this is a ploy. This is one of the ways that the devil will stop the great work that's being done. Go to 2 Peter 2. If you would, 2 Peter chapter number 2. So what, is, what do the conspirators do? They, can, they hire men to pretend to be friends, to pretend to be spiritual, to pretend to be there for your benefit and your protection. All the while in the background, in the backdrop, they're trying to ruin the work of God. 2 Peter 2, look at verse number 1. Notice, but there were false prophets also among the people, even as there might be false teachers. Is that what it says? Notice, it says, even as there shall be false teachers among you who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them and bring upon themselves swift destruction. Notice, these people creep in for what? To bring in false teaching, to bring in false doctrine. And look, everything we base upon as a church is in the word of God, is it not? Amen. And the devil would love nothing more than to destroy the foundation of the doctrines of the word of God. So what does the devil do? He brings in false people to ruin the doctrines of the word of God. But notice what it says. In verse 2, notice, and many shall follow their pernicious ways. Not only do they want to bring false doctrine, they want to bring in division. Their goal is to get you to follow them. Their goal is to get you to quit the great work that's being done and for you to leave this church. And look, if people leave this church for following an infiltrator, then you know what? They fell, they fell into the ploy of the devil. Because the goal of an infiltrator is to bring in damnable heresies, but also to cause you to leave with them. And so don't be a casualty. You know, this, this, um, on Friday night, Pastor Jimenez preached a great sermon on the sins of the sympathizers. And, you, and that's a great sermon. You should listen, listen to it. But you know what? People leave because they sympathize with infiltrators. They sympathize with bad people. And they become a casualty and the work ceases for, in their life. But that's the goal. Notice verse 13. It says, in verse 13, it says, And shall receive the reward of unrighteousness as they that count it pleasure to write in the daytime spots they are in blemishes sporting themselves notice, with their own deceivings notice while they feast with you look these people will creep in and realize that we're not fighting a physical battle it's not against flesh and blood it is a spiritual battle and there are things that you and i we, we may not get it sometimes i don't get it we don't get it in the flesh but you know what it's because it's a spiritual battle and just realize understand that satan the mastermind conspirator will send infiltrators to stop the great work that's being done. And go back to, to Nehemiah. Go back to Nehemiah, chapter number six. So what are the methods? Well, the method is to distract you. The method is to wear you out. The method is to bring in or send in infiltrators to bring division, to bring in heresy. And lastly, the method, look at verse number 12, it's Nehemiah 6, 12. And notice, notice what it says. And lo, I perceive that God had not sent him, notice, but that he pronounced his prophecy against, against who? Against me. For Tobiah and Sanballat had hired him. What's another method of the great mastermind? The method is to constantly attack the leadership. The devil is constantly attacking the leadership. Notice it says that he pronounced his prophecy against me. These people are constantly attacking who? They're constantly attacking Nehemiah. Notice verse 13. Therefore was he hired notice that I should be afraid and do so and sin that they might have matter for an evil report, that they might reproach, notice, me. Throughout the book of Nehemiah, you know what you see? The enemy's constantly going after the leader. And look, you ought to realize that your pastor and his family and your deacon and the leaders in the church, they have a target on their back. Yeah. And the constant attack against the leadership is something you need to be aware of. At my church, my pastor is constantly under attack. Why? Because the devil would love nothing more than to take down the leader. Right. Look, the devil hates the leadership. The devil is against the leadership. Go if you wouldn't look at Nehemiah 6. And what you have to understand about the constant attack on leadership is that the average church member doesn't even see it. The average church member doesn't even realize what's going on. Nehemiah 6, look at verse number 17, it says, Moreover, in those days, 
the nobles of Judah. Then who are the nobles? Those are the people that are high up, people that you would have looked. These, these are the, the nobility, right? The nobles of Judah sent many letters unto who? Unto Tobiah. And the letters of Tobiah came unto them. Notice, some people in the congregation, they had communication with the enemy. Notice, for there, in verse 18, for there were many in Judah sworn unto him. There were people amongst Nehemiah's people that were loyal to the enemy. Notice, because he was the son-in-law of Shekinah, the son of Arab, and his son Johanan had taken the daughter of Meshulam, the son of Berechiah. Look at verse 19. Also, they reported his good deeds before me. If you would have asked people, hey, what do you think of Tobiah? Hey, man, this is a good guy. He does great deeds. And that's what they do. They go to Nehemiah and they tell him, hey, Tobiah is just this great guy. Always reporting his good deeds to him. Why? Because most people don't realize the constant attack against the leader. And look, Tobiah was a man who was constantly trying to stop the man of God, going against the leadership, trying to stop the work of God. But the people would have said, man, this is a great guy. This guy is full of good deeds. But notice it says, and uttered my words to him. And Tobiah sent letters, notice, to put me in fear. See, the people, they were loyal to the enemy. The people, if you had asked them, what do you think of Tobiah? This is a great guy. He's full of good deeds. All the while in the background, he's going against the leader. And the truth is that the average church member doesn't even realize the constant attack against the leadership. Go back to 1 Corinthians. Go to chapter 16, 1 Corinthians 16. 1 Corinthians 16. And this is something <clears throat> you got to be aware of. That there's a constant attack against your pastor who's doing a great work. There's a constant attack against your deacon and his family for doing a great work. There's a constant attack against my pastor. Any great pastor that's doing a great work for God, there is a constant attack on him, but most people don't even see it. 1 Corinthians 16, before we get there, in 1 Timothy 4.12, Paul told Timothy this. He said, let no man despise thy youth. Paul told Timothy in 1 Timothy 4, let no man despise thy youth. He said, don't allow anyone to hate you. You, you have to think about that. Why is it? Is it because Timothy was just a jerk? I think Timothy was a great guy, but because the devil, he hates spiritual positions. He hates spiritual leadership. In Titus 2, Paul told Titus, he said, let no man despise thee. Paul told Titus and Timothy, hey, don't let anyone hate you. Don't allow anyone to despise you. 1 Corinthians 16, look at verse number 10. It says, notice, now if Timotheus come, here we have Paul writing a letter to the church in Corinth. In, in Corinth. He says, now if Timotheus come, See that he may be with you, notice, without fear, for he worketh the work of the Lord as I also do. Notice, let no man therefore despise him. You know, what is it about Timothy? What is it about Titus? Is it the personality? Or is it the fact that they're in spiritual leadership? Is it the fact because the leadership is constantly under attack? And here, Paul told Timothy, hey, let no man despise him. It is wrong, it is wicked for people in, in church to despise their leadership, to hate their leadership. That is not right. And if people come to you and they just want to badmouth the pastor, they want to badmouth the pastor's wife, they want to badmouth the deacon or the staff, the spiritual leadership, that is a bad person. Right. And it is wrong for people in church to despise the spiritual authority that God has placed in your life. Right. And so realize that the leadership is in constant attack. But here's the thing, most people don't see it. Why? Because they're full of good deeds. And look, realize that people, people eat up flattery. People will flatter you, they'll be friends to you, but if they're subtly criticizing the church and subtly criticizing the, the man of God, that's a bad person. It makes no difference if they want to flatter you. It makes no difference about all their good deeds. They're trying to stop the great work that's being done and realize that people will creep in and they want to turn you against the leadership. Why is it that he, over and over he says, hey, don't allow people to hate you because it is wrong for people to be in church and to despise the leadership. Go to Jude chapter one, if you would, Jude one. Jude 1. So what's another method we see is that the method is the constant attack on leadership. You got to realize that God has placed leadership in our churches. There is a proper authority in a church and we are to submit ourselves unto the proper authority in church. Jude 1, look at verse number 4. Jude 1, 4. Realize that the devil hates authority. Jude 1, 4. For there are certain men, notice, crept in unawares who are before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men. It says there are certain men crept in, unawares, people didn't notice it. Notice in verse number eight, go to verse eight. Likewise, also these filthy dreamers defile the flesh. Notice what they do. Despise dominion. 
What does it mean that they despise dominion? Is that they hate, they despise authority. They hate the fact that there's an ordained man of God over them. They want to be the man of God. They want to be lifted up and seen as the head honcho. They want to take down the man of God. Why? Because is it the person? No, it's because they despise dominion. The devil hates authority. The devil hates the fact that there is spiritual leadership put in place. And look, Nehemiah was doing great work. All the while, there were people against him, people fighting him, but most people didn't even see it. Why is that? Well, look at verse number 16, Jude 1, 16. Why is it that people don't see it? Notice, these are murmurers, complainers, walking after their own lust. Notice, and their mouth speaketh great swelling words. What does it mean that their mouth speaketh great swelling words? They say, hey, when they talk to you, they puff you up. They make you feel great. Man, you're so special. Man, you're the best thing. Man, if you were the leader, man, if you were the pastor, or if you were the pastor's wife, they puff you up and you think, man, I'm so great. This guy loves me. All the while, what do they do? They murmur and complain against the dominion, against the authority that is placed in the church. But notice what it says. And their mouth speaking with great swelling words. Notice having what? Having men's persons in admiration. They, they, they love being admired by people. They love the fact that people speak about their good deeds. They're so great and they're so wonderful. What's the point? Notice, because of advantage. To advance their agenda, to advance their cause, to do what? To go against the leadership. And look, don't, you know, flattery, I've heard Pastor Meta say, flattery is like bubble gum. You know, you chew on it for a little bit, but then you spit it out. And if people are just flattering you and they're giving you gifts and making you feel great, they, they love you, they're wonderful to you, but yet they're going against the authority in the church. They're, they're speaking ill, complaining, murmuring against the pastor and his family, against the deacon and his family, against the spiritual authority. Realize those are bad people. And don't allow flattery to blind you. Don't allow gifts to blind you to the fact that Satan, the mastermind, the conspirator, is constantly attacking against the leadership. See, the devil wants to stop a great work. How's it done? It do, it's done by stopping the man of God. By stopping the great work. And look, our pastors, they're not perfect. But they're, they're men. But you know what? It's the, it's the position. They have the position, the ordained position. And don't think that, don't think that these men are perfect. Look, these men are men like you and I. Right. They, they have struggles. They get sick. They bleed like you. So when they make a mistake, give them some slack. Yeah. Don't jump all over them because they did something small wrong. And don't allow people to just magnify themselves. You'll notice bad people because whenever there's a little mistake, they'll just jump all over it and make it this big, huge deal to magnify themselves and put down the authority. Look, these people are men. And don't allow flattery to blind you to the fact that your pastor and the authority in your church is constantly under attack. Amen. So what are the methods? Well, we see that the devil wants to distract you. Whatever he can do to get you off that wall. He wants to wear you out, cause you to faint in the Christian life. He sends infiltrators. And what, is, what else? He's constantly attacking the leadership. Go back to Nehemiah 4, if you would. Nehemiah chapter number 4. So this morning, what do we see? We see that there's a mastermind. The devil, working, conspiring to stop the great work that's being done in the city of Tucson. We see the motive. What's the motive? The motive is to, to stop the work, to hinder the work of God, to end it. We see the methods to distract you, to wear you out, to send infiltrators, to constantly attack the leadership. Nehemiah 4, look at verse number 15. Notice, and it came to pass, notice, when our enemies heard that it was known unto us. Notice, here we have the, co the covers being blown. When our enemies heard that it was known unto us, and God brought their counsel to naught, that we returned all of us to the wall, every one unto his work. See, the best thing you can do is to be vigilant and to realize that you need to be watchful. That's why it's important to preach the whole book. And thank God you have a man who preaches the whole book. Because if you don't preach against the flatterers, against the devil, they're just going to come in and they're going to do their work. So the best thing you can do as a church member is read your Bible and be vigilant to these things. Because right. notice, it says that when, they, when the enemies heard what was known unto us, then they were able to continue the work. See, the best thing you, you can do on any conspiracy is to shed light on the conspiracy. Yeah. Verse, go to verse number 17. Notice, they which spilled it on the wall, and they that, bear, they that bear burdens with those that laid it, everyone with one of his hands wrought in the work, and with the other hand held a weapon. Go to verse number 21. Notice, it says, notice, so we labored in the work. How is it that you will continue to fight, continue to build the great work that's being done? Is that yes, you have a weapon in your hand and yes, you also have tools to build. See, we fight and we build in the Christian life. And don't think that it's going to stop. And this being your one year anniversary, you know, that's, that's a great feat. But you know what? There's a lot more work to be done. 
There's a lot more lives to be saved. There's a lot more sin to be, to be conquered. There's a lot more ruined families that need to get built up. And so realize that the devil wants to stop the great work that's being done. And you, as a church, you ought to be thankful. You ought to be humble. You ought to keep your nose in the book and realize don't allow Satan to stop the great work that's being done. Let's go ahead and pray. Heavenly Father, thank